we have a gift for you as well and a card here, so we really appreciate you all. Thank you so much. And we, we also have a gift for Sam and Flora here. They had a little mix up here, so we still have that gift for them as well, for, for Sam as well. With that being said, I'm very excited. Um, Corey Fitch is actually with us today to bring the word of God to us. Uh, Corey is a special, special brother. I actually, he's one of the reasons why I'm here and I'm very grateful. Through speaking with him um, and sharing my heart with him, that's really the reason why I'm here. So I'm so grateful for the brother. He's the former student pastor of CBCC, also the former associate pastor of CBCC. And I know he's so glad to be back to bring you the word. So. I have to that word. Now, all you new folks that don't recognize me, you just ask around and you'll find out what all the other folks had put up with while I was here. But that's a very kind of you to um, welcome me back here. I'm, and Zach's right, I'm, I'm so excited to be here and see your faces. And it's actually pretty overwhelming to see your faces and think about, like, all of the ways in which I've been blessed by the people in this room. Um, um, I'm like, I was telling, um, I was telling a certain individual a, a minute ago that uh, it turns out they raised my kids' new favorite babysitter. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about um, just some of the just some of the places I saw this morning and and how they encouraged me in some of my blows. And um, I think about like like I if you ask anybody. Um, You'll, they'll tell you maybe I have a little bit of a tendency in preaching to, eh, you know, get a little teary, um, you know, when, when, uh, the, when I get swept up in the moment. And, uh, and so when, I, when, I, when I'm here, I think about Pat Smith who gave me handkerchiefs for Christmas once. Um, and, uh, is this because I cry a lot? Just like, yeah, I cry a lot. Um, and so just like as I'm, as I'm among you and thinking about you, I was just like, I just, I'm so thankful. Uh, to be to be here and to see your faces and to see um, all the all the grace of God to me through you. So know that I'm blessed to be here. I'm thankful to be here, and uh, hope that uh, we are edified by our time together in God's Word. Uh, this morning I want to survey uh, the Book of Judges together. I noticed you guys have been in the New Testament a lot. Lately, and so I thought it might be fun to skip over to the Old Testament uh, briefly. And so I thought Judges would be good. I thought, hey, I've only got one Sunday. Why not cover a whole book? Well, that sounds reasonable, right? Uh, so we're going to jump into Judges. So if you want to turn there, you can do that. And let me tell you a bit about Judges uh, so that we can get our bearings uh, while you're turning there. Uh, Judges starts up just after Joshua and the Israelites have settled in the promised land. So uh, kind of the background there is that God had saved this guy named Abraham and told Abraham that his descendants would fill this new land and would be a blessing uh, to the nations around them. That they would bless the world. And after spending hundreds of years in slavery in Egypt, God raised up Moses uh, to miraculously free this people from slavery and bring them into this new land. And Judges tells the story of what happened after Joshua, Moses' successor, passes away and the people are now in the land that God had promised them, the land that God had given them so that they could multiply and bless the world. So that's where we're at in the history of God's people as we get into Judges. So let's dive in, and uh, I want to read Judges 2, 6 through 19, uh, as our main passage this morning, and as a passage that does fairly sum up uh, the intent and message of the book. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going to start in verse 6 of Judges chapter 2. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. 
And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timna and Paris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountains of Gaash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. And so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them. And they were in terrible distress. And then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked who obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. And whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. Would you pray with me? we get into this? Father God, you are a patient God. It is a wonder that you bear with us and that you love us and that you forgive us much more that you desire this. That when you forgive and that when you show mercy and when you pour out your love, it is not begrudging or hesitant. You do not drag your feet or wag your finger. Make us this morning, our Father and God, like yourself in that. Give us your kind of patience as we have gathered together here to sit under your word. Give us a rest. Give us a satisfaction to sit under your message, your truth, and be transformed by it, to know you better for it. Commit this time to you and ask you for your help in having open ears and soft hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so one of the ways that you could sum up, there's many ways to do this, but one of the ways you could sum up the entire message of the Bible is to say that the message of the Bible is the story of God turning chaos into good. The story of God rescuing helpless creation from chaos. So, for example, when the earth is formless and void, God speaks, and there's order and beauty and light. And the world is made with this lush garden and perfect little image bearers living in it to have fellowship with Him. And when those image bearers fall to sin and they plunge that creation back into chaos, God meets that chaos with the promise, the first promise, of a Savior and a Deliverer. A rescuer from that chaos. And later on in, in Noah's day, after the, after the story of the garden kind of comes to a close, we arrive at Noah's day and the chaos of sin, the chaos that Adam and Eve had introduced into the world again, has taken over the world. God meets that chaos by saving one family and turning a flood into a fresh start. And this pattern of, of God just rushing into chaos and, and rescuing people out of it, Turning it around for good is a pattern that continues all throughout God's story. And that's the story that's continuing here in, in Judges. We could say that the central theme of Judges, if you wanted to sum up the basic message or the thrust of Judges, we could say it's this. 
that we need a great king to rescue us from our chaos. Chaos of our sin and all that it causes. We need a great king to rescue us from our chaos. Uh, look, for example, at the last verse of the book. If you're in Judges, flip over to chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 25. This is, the, this is the crescendo of the book. This is the climax of the book. This is, a, this is the summary statement of what we're to walk away with as we end Judges. It says in 21, 25, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And this, incidentally, is one of the reasons why Judges remains relevant today important for us today. Does everyone doing what's right in their own eyes sound familiar? Does it sound exactly like where we live? And this phrase occurs basically four times in the book. There's this emphasis as the book is winding down and we've sat under it and read all of this filth and, and, and ugliness that's been going on throughout the book of Judges. The author says, now you see how all this happened? There was no king, and everyone just did whatever they wanted to do. So the point of Judges is that we need one great deliverer, one great final king to rescue us from our own chaos. Now, what I want to do with this theme is highlight three truths that emerge from it. Uh, three truths throughout the book of Judges that emerge out of this reality that we need that one great king. We need God to bring us and give us that one great king to rescue us from the chaos uh, that our sin causes. So, taken with the whole Bible, I think, Judges shows us three important truths out of this theme of our need for a king. The first is this. Uh, Tim was actually talking about it uh, this morning, and we'll go back to Ephesians 2 that Tim read for us uh, as well to get at this. But, but this is it. This is the first important truth that emerges from this theme of our need for a king, and it's this. Our condition is worse than we've imagined. Our condition is worse than we imagine. In other words, in our sin, we really are worse off than we think we are. I don't know if you've heard that joke about uh, uh, the, guy, the guy falling off the skyscraper, uh, but uh, what, what did the guy falling off the skyscraper say in, in, or shout into every window on the way down? Does anyone know? Okay. On the way down, the guy falling from the skyscraper shouts at every window, I'm still doing fine! We can be a people willfully naive to how bad our situation is. And that's one of the great things that God is getting at in Judges. If you've read Judges, you've probably noticed there's a repeated pattern throughout it. It's this cycle that God's people go through in Judges. We saw it in the, in the passage that we read in chapter 2 this morning. And at first what would happen is that the people would commit evil. They would give themselves over to idols. They would give themselves over to injustice. They would forget God and walk away from Him and disobey Him. And then next in the cycle, God would do something to wake them up from their stupor. He would allow an oppressor to rise up, an, an idolatrous nation. He would say, okay, you want to be idolaters? Well, I'm going to let, I'm going to let the experienced idolaters rule over you. And you can see how that works out for you. And that's what he would do. He would allow an oppressor to rise up and subject them. After that, the people would become uh, sorrowful and they would, um, they, would, they would break under that oppression. They would cry out to God for deliverance and God would raise up a judge, a, a champion, to deliver them. But after the judge dies, the cycle would start over. Only the more times they go through the cycle, they go through the cycle six times in Judges, and every time they go through it, it gets uglier and uglier. Things get worse and worse. Consider some of the shocking sins in Israel that Judges catalogs for us and how they go from bad to worse. First, Israel had been commanded to go into the land, uh, drive out the idolaters, and, and this is a this is a this is a big deal because God knew if they didn't drive out the idolaters, they would just become exactly like them. And that's a big deal because these are folks that are sacrificing their children on their own altars. I mean, this is not a light thing when God tells them, "Okay, I've had enough of these people's sins. I'm calling you to go in and, and drive them out." But instead, what do they do? They 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 kind of do it half-heartedly. 
but they don't finish the job, and they wind up dwelling in the midst of all these idolaters, and guess what? Becoming just like them. Consider Gideon, one of the most famous of the judges. Oh, we have Sunday school lessons about his uh, mighty 300 men and, 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 and the, you know, the, the fleece and all kinds of wonderful lessons that we should have about Gideon, but we sometimes forget to talk about Gideon's dark side. How he tortures and kills people from his own nation because they wouldn't give his 300 men bread. We don't often talk about how after Gideon's success as, as a deliverer, he essentially sets up an idol that becomes a stumbling block to Israel. Or how he took many wives for himself and fathered 70 sons. One of his sons lives to conspire to kill his 69 brothers so that he can take his father's place in leadership in Israel. Take Samson as another shocking example of Israel's fall. Samson had been called by God to be a holy and pure champion for God's people, but he essentially becomes this person who demands to possess whatever he sets his eyes on. And his temper is so bad, at one point, when he loses a bet, he, he kills 30 people who weren't even involved to, to pay his fees. And then the conclusion of the book comes. And it is a seven-layer dip of craziness. Among the horrors at catalogs are pastors who minister just for the money and who don't care if people die so that they can earn a better living. Describes the most horrific and despicable abuse of women as if this was just a matter of course in Israel at the time. People are stabbed with tent pegs in their sleep. A judge so misunderstands the character of God that he sacrifices his own daughter. And one tribe of Israel literally kidnaps the women from another tribe in order to repopulate their own. It is ugly. And the point of recording all this ugliness is to show us what it's like when God says, Okay, you can have it your way. Take it to its logical end. The have it your way. Follow your heart philosophies lead to this chaos. Judges is meant to function for us like a mirror. You might say at this point, oh, wait a minute, I've never looked in the mirror and been that ugly. Like, like you might not feel that, that, that all of the horror that I've just described as happening in Judges uh, reflects your life or the life of anyone that you know, but I don't know that that really changes the validity of the point. I, I don't think we're meant to read Judges and, and are meant to think that we'd be any different if God took his hands off the wheels of our lives. For example, <clears throat> have you ever watch the news or get on Facebook or, or, um, or read the paper and, and, and come across something that makes you say, I just can't believe some people. I know I do. I'll, I'll hear about some new shocking low that we've reached. And I'll say to myself, man, some people, I just can't believe it. But think about it. Why not? Why can't I believe it? Why wouldn't people be that way? Why wouldn't my heart go the same way if not for God's Intervention. Do I really think that the sins I see all around me could never come from my own heart? And even if I am living a good life, even if I am doing good things, do I really think I deserve credit for that? Do I think all the good in me really ever came from me? Seems to be the assumption people live with. But listen to the words of this psalmist. I want to just, I'm going to just read this to you. Um, you don't have to turn there because I want to, I want to do this as a little bit of an exercise. Um, in Psalm, you can write it down if you want and go back to it later. But Psalm 119, verse 56. Psalm 119, verse 56. I want to read half of it for you and ask you to think about something. Okay, so this is the first little line in Psalm 119, 56. The psalmist says, This blessing has fallen to me. This blessing has fallen to me. Now just imagine for a moment, what's he going to say? What's the blessing going to be? Maybe some level of material comfort. God does bless his people that way at times. 
would the blessing be forgiveness or, or, or fellowship with like-minded brothers and sisters? What's the, what's the blessing going to be? Um, um, the, the, the end of his enemies, right? The psalmist talks about his enemies a lot, right? Like, you know, vanquish the enemies, vanquish the evildoers. And believing children. What's, what's the blessing going to be? You, you fill in the blank for your own life. This blessing has fallen to me. If you were to write a song about the blessings that have fallen to you, what kind of song would it be? This is, this is the song the psalmist writes. He says, this blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. Think about what he's saying there. Reverse it. I have kept your precepts. I have obeyed you. I have done what I've commanded, what you've commanded me to do. I've been, I've been good. I've done good, right? But that is a blessing that has fallen to me. That is a blessing from you. I may be doing good, but you did it. And that is our need. That is our need. If there is to be good in us, good done from us, we need that blessing to fall on us from on high. We need God to do it. That's the kind of king we need. Our condition is worse than we could have ever imagined. We need a king to change our condition from the inside out and grant us the blessing of obedience and fellowship with him. We need a king who changes hearts. We need a king who raises the dead. That's the first truth. The second is this. God is more loving and gracious than we can fathom. So, we are worse, yes, than we could have imagined, but God is better than we could have imagined. Better than we could have even ever dreamed. Now think about this for a moment. What motivates God to love us? Motivates God to show us His mercy and grace. If you skim the surface of Judges and read about these cycles of Israel falling into, into the hands of their oppressors and crying out to God for deliverance, you might be tempted to say, well, well God is moved to compassion and, and God is, is moved to show us mercy when we cry out to Him. Like when we're really sorry, when we confess or repent, when we cry enough, His heart is moved and He shows us grace. That's what it seems like when you read this cycle. And then, of course, in a sense, that's, that's true. God does compassionately respond to us. Praise Him. God does compassionately respond to us when we cry to Him. But what makes us, what makes Him love us before that? What makes Him love us before we are sorry? What makes Him love us when we're not very lovable? Now, hold on to that thought for a minute. And turn to chapter 13. I want to notice something together that I think will set us up to answer that question of, of what it is that moves God to love us before we're even sorry, before we even cry out for His rescue. Notice when we get to chapter 13. There's a break in the cycle. The cycle that the, judge, that the people of Israel have been going through throughout Judges, when we get to the last judge, Samson, there's a skip. There's a break. There's a step of the cycle that's missing. Let me see if you can notice it. If you're in chapter 13, you can look at verse 1. Okay, so here we are. We're in the cycle again. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Step one. So, the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Step two. But then, verse two, there was a certain man of Zorah, the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren, and had no children. We, we go on from this verse to, to, to be introduced to Samson. You know, God raised up the judge to deliver the people of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. But notice the author goes straight from the Israel's sin into their suffering under an oppressor and it skips the part where they cry out for help. It doesn't happen. 
The cycle is totally missing the part where Israel cries out for the deliverance. The part where they're supposed to be sorry for their sin. What we see here is that Israel has totally resigned themselves to their subjection. They've accepted their servitude to idol worshippers. We can see this in chapter 15, if you flip a couple pages over. By, by chapter 15, Samson has grown into a big, strong, long-haired bully, and he's started picking fights with the Philistines, and he has been pretty successful. Not anyone has been able to master Samson. And he's been taking out Philistines left and right, causing trouble, starting fights. And, and this is how Israel responds. In chapter 15, starting in verse 11. It says, Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Atom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so have I done to them. And they said to him, Well, we have come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. They're actually upset with Samson for winning. Like, they're upset with Samson for uh, undermining their oppressors. And they tell Samson, Don't you know that the Philistines are in charge? Don't you know better? Why are you rocking the boat? The people have forgotten God. They've accepted their place under the tyranny of a people that worship false gods, and they're not even thinking about asking for rescue. It's like they don't even notice that they're supposed to be different. And so what does God do when his people are like that? When they don't even cry out for help anymore, and they just live in the chaos of their own sin and slavery. Here's what he does. He raises up a boat rocker. He raises up a wedge. He uses something or someone to rock the boat, to stir things up. And that's all Samson does. Israel was becoming so like the Philistines that they were just okay with the Philistines' lordship over them. So God uses Samson's temper and his selfishness and his foolishness to upset things between the two people so that the two people would remember there are two different people. There's supposed to be a difference between them. He raises up Samson so things can finally get bad enough for Israel finally to ask for God's help again. To yearn for that one true king who could rescue them. In other words, what God does when his people forget him is God does not give up on us. When, when God sees that his people have forgotten him and, and they're, they're so enslaved to their sin the, the tyranny of that chaos that they don't even ask for help God does not shuffle off in self-pity to go pick daisies. He moves. And he moves in ways that bring his people back toward him. Now let's circle back a second to what I asked us to think about a few minutes ago. Why does he do this? Why doesn't he just give up on us? Before we're even sorry, why does he love us? Why does he keep moving toward us? Does he provoke us to, to come back? It's not because he needs us. And it's certainly not because we're lovely that he loves us. What motivates God to love sinners? Here it is. It's God. God motivates God to love sinners. So yes, our condition is worse than we could have imagined, but God loves and rescues sinners like us because he's just that good. Some say that this truth is the very truth that was the heart of the Reformation 500 years ago. We're about to celebrate 500 years since Martin Luther kicked off the Protestant Reformation. And this is what he said. He said it this way. He said, the love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of God which lives in man loves sinners, evil persons, fools and weaklings, in order to make them good, wise, and strong. Rather than seeking its own good, the love of God flows forth and bestows good. Therefore, this is the key, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. Sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are 
attractive. So Luther, he, he looked at the way in which you and I normally love things, and he said, you know, when we love something, it's usually because we went out looking for something lovely. Something lovely caught our eye and won our affection. Our love finds that which pleases it, and then he says, but God's love is not like that. The love of God creates that which is pleasing to it. Sinners are attracted, he says, because they are loved, not the other way around. And Luther didn't get this out of nowhere. He got it from, among many other places, Ephesians 2 was already read for us. How wonderful that Tim and I didn't collaborate at all. <laughs> that the Holy Spirit just oversees those things and takes care of those things and, 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 and shepherds his people. But Luther got this from, among many other places, Ephesians 2, starting in verse 4, that says, God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he loved us, he saved us, just because he loved us. By grace you have been saved. And he's raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God loves sinners because he is awesome. Because he is loving. Because he is that good. He loves sinners not for their beauty, but to make them beautiful. And notice, too, in Ephesians, that this grace to us in Jesus Christ, this kindness shown to us through Jesus, will literally fill eternity. <sighs> this is why we can say that God is gracious and loving beyond what we can fully fathom. You notice verse 7. The coming ages, it says. The eternity will be a show of the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness Toward us. Why call them immeasurable? Why is it important to see that they're immeasurable? Think of something that's so big, eternity's not long enough to measure it. Eternity's not long enough to measure the kindness of God to us in Christ. Eternity will not be enough time to measure the depths nor climb the heights of how much God has loved and transformed this through Jesus Christ. God is without a doubt more loving, more gracious than we could have ever imagined or even dreamed. That's what Judges shows us again and again as he returns to his people and he loves them and he forgives them and he sends them their deliverer. That's the second truth. The third is this. That God's true king must solve the greatest dilemma ever known. This goes to the glory of God. Judges introduces us to, well, it introduces to, but it reaffirms this dilemma that God gets great glory from solving and dealing with. Now, what do I mean by that? What, what is the greatest dilemma ever known? Well, basically, the whole Testament, and especially Judges, that raises this dilemma for us to deal with. It introduces us to a serious tension between two things. God's righteousness on the one hand and God's mercy on the other. Those things are actually kind of in tension throughout the whole Old Testament. In other words, these two things are in tension. Or this question introduces a tension. How can God be righteous and just forgive guilty sinners? How can he do both? How can he do this? And Judges doesn't give us an answer. It doesn't. But there are hints. There are previews. There are whispers of God's plan for solving this dilemma. Let me give you a few. One hint is that many, if not all, the deliverers that God chooses are the unexpected ones, the least likely candidates. Take Ehud, for example. Ehud's my favorite. 
go home and read Judges 3. Think about the Elud. Maybe read it before you show it to your kids. Think about how you're going to explain it to them. Chapter 3 makes this point of mentioning that, that the judge Ehud was a left-handed man, which isn't a big deal today. It doesn't affect you socially, I don't think, to be left-handed. But back then, it was a big deal. It, 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 it did not make you a stereotypical or likely candidate for uh, being a champion warrior. Ehud, as a left-handed man, was not the man that anyone would have picked to save the day. Some commentators even say that, that uh, Ehud was left-handed because his right hand was disabled. In any case, the point is that Ehud is not the man you'd expect to be the champion. It doesn't fit the stereotype. Another hint is how all the victories of God's people and judges are really victories won not through worldly strength, but through weakness. At least weakness in the world's eyes. Whole armies, thousands, conquered by 300 men and some torches. Can you imagine being one of the 300 men? Okay, Gideon, what's our plan? Oh, um, we're going to go out at night and light some fires and shout, and that's going to take care of it. I don't think I would go. Like, if that was the battle plan. There's a, notice there's only 300 of us, Gideon. What are we gonna, what, how are we going to feed the, th the thousands? We're just going to go out and light a couple of torches and shout a lot. God, again and again, throughout Judges, he delivers his people in, in, in ways that are foolish, ridiculous, in, in the world's eyes. Yet another hint, Samson, uh, the career of Samson, who is betrayed by a close confidant. Turned over, Gentile, turned over to Gentiles to be chained, tortured, and humiliated, but who actually winds up achieving his greatest victory in life by what? Sacrificing his life. Where else does God do things like these? Where else does God deliver in circumstances like these? Jesus, of course, Jesus. The king that no one would have expected or predicted. God in the flesh, born in a barn, raised by a carpenter. Jesus, the king, who won his greatest victory, not by a show of worldly might, but instead by giving himself up, sacrificing himself for sinners on the cross. And that's why Jesus is the king we need. He solves the dilemma. God can forgive guilty sinners because Jesus has joyfully and willingly taken their place. God has shown both his righteous wrath against sin and his unfathomable love for sinners at the cross of Jesus Christ. And Judges is full of these hints that this is God's plan all along. That this is the way God's true king will save his people. And that's why we should want Jesus to be our king. He's totally unlike all the others. Because our king, with all the authority in the universe, the ability to speak and have his way, with all of his might and all of his power, used all that strength to die for his enemies. To die for sinners like me and you. To take our punishment, to take our sin and our ugliness on himself and cast it away forever. That's the way God saves. And that forms his call to us today. Give yourself to that king. Leave your sin, hate your sin, walk away from it and give yourself to King Jesus. Now let me close with this. You read Judges and it might be easy to be discouraged. You read Judges and it might all the grimness might weigh heavy on you. And you might look around at the state of the world today and feel the same way. You watch the news you know, it seems like they're always giving you some reason to worry or something to worry about. You look at the direction our culture is heading in we, we 
still live in a culture of idolatry. The idols have become more sophisticated, but they're still there. Like, we haven't come far from child sacrifice, for example. We just do it in sanitized clinics instead. Sacrificing our children to the gods of comfort and convenience and personal preference. You look at everyone just doing whatever's right in their own eyes, and, and you might be discouraged by that. It would be natural to be discouraged by that. But Judges, though it is grim, is not meant to discourage us. Rather, because of Judges, we have every reason to be hopeful. Judges was written to show us that we need that one great king, and it hints at him, and it looks forward to that one great king, that newsflash, came and is reigning today, ruling today at God's right hand. Jesus is that great living victor over sin and death. And one day, in the blink of an eye, we will be dwelling with him in his promised land, his new heaven and his new earth, where every tear will be wiped away and every sin vanquished. It's a very exciting time to be a Christian. Because we know the king has come. And he delivers us for good. And he's going to make this world all new. So let us give ourselves to this king because he's the only one worth bowing the knee to. Let's pray. Father and God, we thank you for King Jesus. We thank you that because of him, sin and death has met their match. I thank you for this church, and I pray for us as brothers and sisters in Christ that we be edified in the truth that you are a good God, you are a patient Father, you are a loving and merciful Savior, and you have given us this great history-altering King to love and trust for our salvation. And we pray that we would, in Jesus' name, amen. Stand and join with us. Sing a, I think an appropriate song to close out here. I just want to remind you that at, uh, CDCC, we do encourage you to enjoy the blessing of giving. And uh, we don't pass a plate here, but we do have boxes by the doors for offering. We feel so compelled to uh, give back a little bit of what God has given you. Sing with us this last song, song of celebration uh, called Bless the Lord. Thank you.
for who you are, Lord, for Lord, bringing us to a put faith in Jesus Christ and your family. Lord, it's amazing to see that the scriptures testify to you, that the scriptures, even in the Old Testament, can testify to Jesus. As they show us through the book of Judges, their desperate need of a Savior and a great king and our desperate need of a Savior. And how Samson was a great picture of Jesus, that he gave himself for the people of God. And in the same way, Lord, you've given yourself for us, Lord, the people of God. You have given your life, Lord, for us. Even when we weren't calling to you, even when we were wayward in our way, Lord, you died for us. And you loved us as the true and great and holy king that we need. God, just empower us with your word. Change us through your word, Lord. And not just today on Sunday, God, but work through the week. Give us a burning desire to hear from you through your word. To see Jesus, not just in Matthew or Mark, but in the book of Judges and all through the Old Testament. To see your love and your beauty throughout the pages of Scripture. God, bless us in the coming week, Lord. And bless us in the coming week, and to treasure you throughout our day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just a couple of very brief announcements before we go. We will be having Bible study this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. We'd love you to come out to that. And we will be having high school youth group as well. So just wanted to mention that. And we will be having Sunday school after service as well. So go in peace and thank you all so much.